slides. So some of these slides are his, some of these slides are mine, depending on where we're coming from time-wise. So let's start off with a history of computing. Um, generally, when we think about the framework of devices we have today, it's really <coughs> interesting that we have advanced technology so much that we're carrying around effectively what would have been considered a supercomputer in our pockets, all right? So back in 1943, whenever it was founded, um, Jay Watson, who was then the uh, chairman, or what would be a, uh, effectively called the CEO today, of IBM was quoted as saying, I think maybe in the world there is a market for five computers. <laughs> I can see, I can foresee five computers. I think he missed it by several orders of magnitude, all right? But this is considering, you know, this is what, 80, yeah, 80 years ago, close to 80 years ago, okay? That's, uh, that's decent, right, for the time. He would have uh, probably been able to at least convince people that there was something worth building. Hey, there's, there's a demand for five of them, so that's a good start, right? You know, some, some, something would be worth building. Uh, Steve Wozniak, all right, if you guys, you know who Woz is? All right, he's a guy that created, like, the iPod and pretty much uh, the iPhone in a lot of ways. Um, the... Mac, as it is conceptualized, is said to be uh, Waz's work. Uh, of the, uh, the two Steves, uh, you have Steve Jobs, which everybody is usually pretty familiar with, but Steve Wozniak is the one who's still around, still making decisions in this process. He says, all of a sudden, we've lost control of our devices, right? We can't turn off the internet. We can't turn off our smartphones. We can't turn off our computers. You used to be able to ask a smart person a question, right? Now who do you ask? It starts with the word G-O, and it's not God, right? So you don't, you don't pray for answers, you, you, know, you search for them through your benevolent robot overlords at Google, all right? So uh, it's interesting how much of our lives we've effectively turned over to these devices and systems. Are we comfortable with that? No, but it's still the way it is. So the biggest hope we have is maybe to be able to push the currents, right? Push the stream of the system that we are all living inside of and be able to continue to advance the technology. So where does this stuff come from? We tend to think about computers as a relatively modern innovation, but in fact, computational devices have been around for quite a while. Anybody ever used an abacus? Okay, they're kind of fun. They're, uh, they, if, you're, if you're you know kind of real good at counting on your fingers or whatever else, they're kind of like an additive device. And uh, structurally, if we look at this, the first few of these can be found <coughs> constructed out of malleable materials like brass around 2400 BC. Now, the ones that were made of wood may go back further before that because they just didn't survive the translation of the roughly 4,400 years that we're talking about in that particular space, all right? So 4,000 to 5,000 years ago was the first time that people had enough necessity to frequently do enough calculation or mass calculation to need a device to help them do it. Do we think about 5,000 or 4,000 years ago in history as being big enough demand and, you know, like stocking and management of funds and counting how big your sheep herd is and that kind of thing to have necessity for an abacus? No. We don't think about how much civilization actually has, you know, effectively already had grown by the period of roughly 2400 BC. Now, the population of the planet today and would absolutely dwarf anything that was going on in that region, right? The average city, like square mile of a city was probably the population of most countries at that point in time. So it's interesting that there was still technology developed in demand. Okay, funny enough, uh, there's a good example of a uh, Japanese postal worker using an abacus facing off with a private Thomas Wood who had one of the first electronic calculators, all right? The abacus user won, <laughs> definitively won, all right? Four out of five competitions, four out of five rounds, the abacus won. Why? Because it's the user of the technology, not the technology that separates the effectiveness of its particular implementation. As I often talk about, and I say one of the biggest quotes, the most common quotes I come across in circles when it comes to AI is AI will not replace you. Someone who uses AI better than you will replace you. 
So when we think about the way in which it impacts us internally, we need to think about it as a tool, right? It is a facilitator of accomplishment, not something that is intrinsic to the accomplishment. AI does not produce work. Humans utilizing AI to enhance their operations produce work. AI cannot produce beauty, for instance, right? But AI can produce something that a human can utilize for inspiration or a human can cultivate into something that we might consider beautiful. Any, any of you ever heard of the Antikytheria mechanism? All right, so this one goes a little bit further forward and is this uh, nasty little uh, floated up to the uh, surface or you know float, floated up off the surface of the ocean device, uh, which was originally thought to be a astronomical calculation device, okay? They've gone back and forth as to what this thing was used for. It is complex, it has internal weaving, meshing, sequences of gears, and hands in operation. The work on the right hand side is one that has been sort of rebuilt, reverse engineered from the one that's been found, and from pieces that have been found elsewhere. But this device is over 2,000 years old as well, and structurally indicates that ancient man, right, far before the 17, 16 and 1700s, whenever watches became watches and clocks uh, made out of gears and metal spring operations, probably already had mastery of that process. What's the indicator here? So somewhere around the time, right, 10 BC, 20, you know, was that uh, 2,030 some years ago, right? We're looking at it and we're saying that they had springs and gears and all this other stuff. And then all of a sudden, in the 1600s, oh yeah, clocks came out. What happened in between? What did we forget? What did we forget? There is an interesting relationship between ancient civilization, the development of technology in the ancient world, and a period of time in history in which it seems like history collapsed and forgot technological development. Why do I harp on this? Why am I sitting on this slide for a moment? What happens whenever we forget how certain things work? From one generation to the next, the one generation studying and operationally understanding the internal mechanisms of these systems, and then the next generation saying, ah, that's something I can look up in a book, right? Mm -hmm. What happens before it becomes impossible for us to know how to even fix the things that two generations before us originally innovated? How many of you know how a microwave works? How many of you know well enough how a microwave works to fix it, right? I thought about this the other day. I thought about this as a weird thought experiment, right? You said, if I got sent back in time and I could go to any period of time in history, that would be great, right? You could go back to the ancient world and you could have a cell phone, right? With all the magic and things this has. This thing didn't do crap, okay? Without being connected to the internet, this is useless. Yeah. All right. Without having a plug-in hook this up to, this is useless. All right. How many of you could build a generator, build a rectifier, generate a stable 110 volt, then build the power inverter in order to be able to plug this in? Right. Do I get to pay, take the generator and my phone plug-in and all the other accessories with me? No. Nope. Uh huh. No, I don't. Okay. So the weird part about this, this is the element that I'm thinking about in my mind is I could do nothing, right? I would be just as useless as I am right here. Uh, but the <laughs> relationship is I go back in time and I couldn't reinvent, you know, uh, could, could you blow glass and make one tube transistor? Just one, you know, like help innovate in that space. No, we all know electronics. We know it's a thing, right? We can figure out circuits and all that stuff. We don't want to make it. It's because we've been abstracted from the realities of the physical construction. We're, and we're risking further abstraction, even from the concept of knowledge retention. So that's a fear that I have in my mind is that we're gonna experience, or we could experience another gap period within history in which we literally sort of unlearn many of the technological developments we have because over time we either don't use them or they fundamentally collapse. So this concept of emergence, collapse, and rediscovery actually goes for several different technologies from the ancient world to the modern world, all right? So where did modern computers come from? Anybody ever heard of uh, Babbage's analytical engine? Yes. 
Okay, this is a pretty pretty neat piece of technology. Um, the last time that I saw it was at the uh, Museum of Science and Industry. I think that it is in DC now, so they moved it. But this piece of technology is actually still physically around. Okay, somebody thought to keep it, which is really cool. That I really like it. Well, I don't know if this is actually the original, but it is a contemporary replica, right? So contemporary reconstruction. So we know that there is a version of it. What is it? It's a piece of internal electronic mechanisms that are allowed to adjust parameterizations and matriculate, move elements inside of it based upon sequences of analytical process. So when you're adding numbers together, it can add numbers together based upon generation of decimalization, etc. What was it first used for? All right, so census work, primarily. Evaluation of how many people there were, uh, how much space they occupied, right? Density of them, things like how much money was going to be given to an area based upon income, demographics, and uh, what kind of zoning operations were gonna take place. Many civic applications, things that benefited humans, benefited people, were the first applications of computing technology. It wasn't until a little bit later on that computing technology matured into being something that was actually relatively sinister in some respects, right? Many of the applications for these systems became what? Trajectories for things like missiles and ordnance, right? Howitzers, be able to figure out how far it was going to shoot and how much of a timer had to put on it in order for it to blow up at exactly the right time above the ground so they could inflict maximum casualties, all right? So it went quickly between something that was beneficial to humanity to something that had massive catastrophic impacts to human civilization. So we have to watch anything we build can go very quickly from very neat, novel, uh, operable technology to something that is going to hurt us in the long run. Whenever we think about this, we think about the idea of things that are approximations of our internal brains, right? We think about an internal evolution or a revolution, I would say, of the electronic replica of brain-like structures. We go from solving intelligent systems, right, in the 1970s operating with a 2300 pound PDP 1120, which uh, had 16 kilobytes of memory and a 1.2 megahertz processor. Cost 20 grand, all right? <laughs> Which, that's at the time, okay? Inflate that for the, what is that, 50 some years that we have, that means that it costs probably almost, what, 90, 70 to 90 thousand dollars, okay? Maybe even more than that, maybe even something like 150 if you calculate for the 80s gap. What happens here on the other side? This is your Apple Watch, all right? <laughs> Orders of magnitude more powerful. Orders of magnitude more powerful, right? gigahertz level processors, megabytes of cache memory just on the chip, right? Cache memory, localized memory in the megabytes, from the kilobytes to the megabytes, and then potentially gigabytes of both operational and storage memory on something that is this big around, okay? So crazy how much we've gone in such a short period of time. And the cost has gone from being a thing that could only occur within confined spaces, was massive, was not something you could probably uh, afford the power on your own, to something you can literally carry around with you on your arm. What's the next phase of the process? Quite frankly, I don't know, but I'm gonna guess anyway. Partially because of the fact that I think that that is one of the fundamental parts of being human is our sort of desire to try to project the next thing. You guys recall the discussion we had last Thursday. One of the things that I said was related to, or potentially most principally related to, the idea of intelligence was the capacity to successfully predict something that would happen in the future, right? If I'm a predator, or even if I'm just hungry and I'm sitting in my house, being able to predict where I'm most likely to find food is going to be useful for my survival, right? going in the right direction, sort of expending the appropriate amount of energy and effort in order to get to the optimal desired outcome. We are, if nothing but, lazy, all right? So there is a one principal element that is economy. How much energy do I have to spend in order to accomplish my desired goal? 
So the economy of the process is going to constantly be reflected in the necessity for us to try to be efficient, right? Efficiency is at the core. The more we can get out of the least amount of effort, we consider what? Always best, right? It's ROI, return on investment. How much do I want to put in and how much do I want to get out? Our goal, our process, our constant striving to be able to figure out how to make things easier is an effort to try to push down the energy requirements to execute anything <coughs> in space. So when we think about this, about computational intelligence, we think about artificial intelligence. Most of the systems we're going to describe in here are going to be aff affiliated or associated with artificial neural networks, all right? And then by consequence, mechanisms that effectively go in front of those artificial neural networks that we're gonna call deep learning structures, all right? We still utilize for the most part what would be considered a classical artificial network, uh, artificial neural network paradigm for something like the fully connected layers at the end of a sequence for processing. But deep learning is a mechanism that where we utilize biologically inspired networks to do things like extraction of useful visual and semantic features. We talked about a lot of those toward the end of the last lecture, right? Shape, color, texture, orientation, right? How many of that structure? So you have patterns and repetition, frequency of those patterns, duration of elements in between them. We think about something like sound or voice, we take it for granted that our devices can so quickly and easily understand us, but how few years ago was it that you could have very, very limited success in attempting to utilize voice activation for a mobile device, or even for attempting to use voice transcription? Something that I take for granted today is I constantly take notes with my phone using speech to text. I love it, it's like having my own little secretarial tool here, right, This just types out all of my thoughts. But five years ago, right, six years ago, when I started my PhD, I had to use, like, Dragon Naturally Speaking. Anybody ever heard that software? Okay, it was garbage, right? And it was still <laughs> awesome. Like, it was expensive, and it did way better than you might think, but in comparison to what we have today, it was remedial in its essence. What's the difference between those two? It's actually the difference between these two things right here. Artificial neural networks were employed in Dragon's core processing elements. They helped it extract which were useful features from the system and prescribe phoneme recognition. However, because of the fact that all the features were handcrafted, meaning that humans had to get in there and adjust parameterization in the system, the system had to learn from limited human input, and then had to try to pattern imprint on your specific method of speech, there wasn't a lot of opportunity to take advantage of large data sets, right? We didn't have millions and millions of people with links between spoken and written text that we could utilize to reference. That is when deep learning came along and companies like Google started to leverage it, right? We're gonna talk about how they leverage it. But these mechanisms are also followed up by other processes which we'll discuss in brief, not in high detail, but in brief to a certain degree. Uh, reinforcement learning, which is a mechanism that, fo that functions very much like normal human process learning, right? It's sort of the, uh, uh, the try, try and fail, guess and check mechanism, uh, as well as sort of an automated generation process. So I might uh, do something like train an AI to drive down a track or to drive a, a car on a virtual environment, and effectively a reinforcement learning system would be one that would repeatedly attempt to try to drive crash, start over again, crash, start over again, and after a period of time, eventually refine its attempts based upon learning something every time it failed, okay? Do we get the advantage as humans of failing over and over and over again? It really depends, sometimes we do. All right, when you're real little, you do, right? You're real little, when you're little kids, right, we fail over and over again, we don't think about it, but think about watching a child do even the most basic set of tasks. Failure is in completely inherent in that process. Frustration gets inherent in that process. If you can watch it with small children that are attempting to do something, right? Attempting to speak, get an idea across, attempting to move something from one area to another with their limited uh, mobility or limited structural capacity, right? Those considerations extend to the idea of 
this sort of robust approach to learning that is reinforcement learning. We are going to look at, but not completely in depth, because there are other coverages for the uh, applications of fuzzy logic, applications of uh, evolutionary or genetic algorithms. All right, those have some real utility in some AI systems for uh, generative refinement of subsets of material. And then uh, we will not cover, but I will mention here, uh, uh, Ziegler and the uh, particle swarm paradox, okay? So if you've ever seen sort of like swarm logic or uh, like drones operating in tandem with one another, many times those systems have to be capable of dynamically restructuring the elements within that system. Think about a swarm of, uh, of bees or a, a group of ants moving together. They have to be able to both communicate with one another, so they have to be able to have a, a logic that is supra to the individual entity, and they have to have their own individual intelligences to parse that material. So there is an internal intelligence in each of the individual elements of the system, and then there is a collective intelligence that comprises a superset of all of their intelligences and their capacities to both understand the environment and then react to changes within the environment, all right? It changes as adversarial, external to the swarm or in, uh, internal to the individual entity, as well as structural changes within the swarm itself. So there's a high degree of fluidity and interconnectivity that can be mashed, probably utilizing graph theory processes, which we won't cover in depth, but we will talk about in brief. All right. Where does machine learning fall with respect to AI paradigms? I would say that if you think about structural subsets, let's first talk about the global subset of AI. We say that knowledge databases or knowledge structure bases, right, tool-driven systems, expert systems, if you guys will follow me in that space, thinking about an idea of an expert system first inheriting uh, knowledge from, let's, let's say, a human teaching a tree system how to make decisions. Where do these most commonly occur? Things like business workflows or uh, medical science in, or environments where I'm attempting to diagnose somebody, right? A diagnostic chart. You ever flipped to the back of an electronics device and seen the troubleshooting section in which it says, first try this. If it's not that, then try this, right? It's sort of, it's saying if then, then this, right? Else if type statements. Effectively, basic AI is a series of chained rules that we attempt to try to build up into a larger system. AI as a paradigm is kind of a misnomer in some senses in that it doesn't actually require it to be as adaptable as we typically tend to think about whenever we talk about machine-driven intelligences. We've actually began to interpose the concept of AI on these other systems that set inside of it, all right? They are subsets, so AI is with, within the scope of AI, but what traditional AI started off being was very much a rule set based system. Could we effectively reduce the concept of cognition or learning into a series of steps that we could algorithmically implement? We all know algorithms are great. We all know that procedural code is great. It has high stability, it has repeatability, it is stable effectively, but we also know that it doesn't change. Once you set the code in place, it runs the same way and is not going to go back and attempt to do something to itself. So it is a base of knowledge distilled down to its most principal components. The next version of the system would be the principles of machine learning. Notice, machine learning is inside the scope of AI, is a subset. This is where we first started to think about the idea that these AI paradigms needed to be able to adapt to changes not only in their task, but in their environment, right? With, within the scope of time. So a individual, right, a person, a human individual, needs to be able to adapt to the things that they're doing every given day. We all have a variety of tasks and a variety of expectations. We switch sort of a set of functional code within our framework to be able to access and operate within that particular paradigm efficiently. Some of you may have kids, some of you may have you know, roommates, some of you have uh, you know, significant others, whatever, in that kind of space. So what are we thinking of? We're thinking of 
being able to switch how you communicate with an individual or what sort of tasks you're expected to do in that space. Going from one class to another class, or even just the concept of sitting in a class, activates another subset of routines and processes. But you don't stick and you don't stay the exact same person throughout all of your life, right? We're not a read-only memory. We're not a CD once you burn it and then it's fixed, right? We are adaptable uh, RAM, random access memory, to a certain degree, to a certain degree. There is actually a hybridization that is implicit there, and we'll talk about that because there is something that is called plasticity, and that is the degree to which our hardwired circuitry, our networks of connectivity, can be reconstructed or can be reallocated in order to be able to accomplish new tasks and processes. Machine learning operates from the perspective of something like logistic regression, all right? We'll talk about regression. Some of you will already have uh, that in uh, intimate detail from taking ISL, so we're gonna go through that relatively quickly. If you have not taken ISL and you're still here, uh, we're glad to have you on board, but understand there's gonna be some terminology and some processes that we're gonna have to get up to speed with very quick, all right? So if you haven't done regression, and you haven't done classification, right? You don't understand the difference between clustering and uh, supervised learning, right? Maybe this is the time to, you know, send me an email, talk to me. I will put up some resources for you. I'm going to put up some videos. Most of those are going to cover the basics of neural networks, which we will cover in implicit detail. But I will also probably try to put some stuff up about regression analysis and probabilistic theory. You're going to have to link back on your stats, your probability, and you know, apply probability basis in order to be able to get some of the things we're talking about here. But machine learning was an approach to code level implement many of those machine regression algorithms so that we could create models for expected processes based upon these methodologies. Representation learning was the next step on top of classical machine learning, and that implied the use of shallow autoencoders. These are mechanisms that uh, utilize compression, internal compression and internal hidden layers to attempt to reduce the sort of signal to noise ratio characteristics. We talked about the idea that machine learning in general, the goal of it would be to you do and employ the same processes as humans do. So one of the things humans are good at is sorting useful information from unnecessary information, right? How do we determine what's useful and what's not useful? Typically, it's based upon what we already know and then attempting to determine what's new, novelty. We prize novelty amongst everything else in our human brains, all right? But it's not always a good thing because if I'm talking about something you already understand and then I incorporate some new information to it while I'm talking about it and you're zoning out because you're like, I already know this, all right? Your brain's not gonna pick up on the new information. This is a problem for me in classes like chemistry and biological sciences and stuff because there was a, a, a constant process, there was a cycle, right? We're gonna talk about cells. So the first class you talk about cells and they're just these little boxes, right? And then the second class you open the box and you think about all the stuff inside of it, right? And then the next class you open that box again and the boxes inside the boxes, they start unpacking the genes and the ribosomes and all this other stuff and you're like, whoa, hold on. <coughs> I thought I knew what you meant by cell, right? You lost me back at cell, okay? So whenever we're thinking about how we integrate novel information, representation theory is actually a mechanism for, utilized within paradigm of autoencoding to utilize multiple examples of similar components and then distill or take out the things that are similar amongst all of those, right? It's the here are many things and kind of the Sesame Street song. One of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong, right? Which one of the things is different? We do that with children. So I encourage you always, when thinking about this paradigm, what is it that we do with kids? How do we teach kids, right? What is special about it? Since we don't know how to explain how we learn, we no more than we know how to explain how we can walk or how we can form sentences, then we're gonna to have to go back to the source of those that are currently in the process of learning it and observe them. Many of the most useful observations about learning paradigms and processes has come through the study of the psychology of what it takes in order to be able to pick out unique characteristics of things like images, 
and, and phrases, right, words and sequences of words, which elements are new, which elements are not. I talk about this in my ISL and my AI class, but um, I, I say representation learning runs on the theory that this doesn't actually have enough capacity to store 70 to 90 years worth of visual information. These are not a camera, okay? These are not a camcorder constantly recording your life. These are a momentary updated impulse system that only stores information, only writes new info up here, if that new info possesses something of merit and value. Think about this. When you came to school today, how much of that trip do you remember? Transitory periods in time, right? The more you've taken that trip, the less information you code about it because nothing novel happened, nothing new happened. So let's go back to the idea of encoding information with respect to utility. Why store a memory if that memory is no different than the other memory you already have? So I'm gonna compare the new information to the old memory that I have, and I'm gonna say, all right, what about the old memory could be updated with any of this new information? If a 100% correlation exists, meaning the new memory and the old memory are identical, what am I gonna do with it? I'm gonna get rid of the new memory. This is actually the reason why as you get older, time appears to pass more quickly. Why? Because as you age, your brain is not encoding as many new memories. Since it's not encoding as many new memories, there's actually not as many linkages to import or imply the passage of time between successive memories. So the fact that your brain is becoming more and more concrete, that it's more fixed based upon the information, you want time to pass more slowly in your life, expose yourself to new and diverse experiences because those new experiences will force yourself to be able to remember, <coughs> right? So since we're optimized to try to remember and encode new information, we have to incentivize ourselves behaviorally in order to get the desired outcome. Representation learning implies you don't remember what a duck looks like. Not a specific duck. You remember what the composite of all ducks you've ever seen look like. Okay? You possess the concept of duck. That is a representation. It is a high level look down at the concept of what it means to be a specific waterfowl. All right? What's the difference between a duck and a goose? right, and a swan. I also tell you, you don't remember what a swan looks like. You've seen many of them, but your brain does not record that as if it is a snapshot of a specific swan. If you ask people to sit down and draw a picture of any type of visual information from memory, what you will note is even those people who are highly trained in both observation and art will not be able to 100% reproduce things they do not have in front of them because that's not how the brain works. So we're going to emulate and generate processes that are like the brain. This representational memory process means that we're going to leverage the <coughs> idea of storing representations of objects, types, and classes of information, both with their unique and distinguishing elements intact. So a lot of what we're gonna do with our deep learning processes are going to follow on from representation learning into integrated processes for deep learning processes, all right? The primary example given here, I think, is probably not exactly deep learning, but we will say that a, a deep structure, prior to, the, prior to like last fall, there really was no standardized accepted definition of what makes something deep. They have finally sort of decided, and I don't know who exactly they is, I'm sure there's probably many people in the they, but there are definitions that are now starting to surface with relatively high frequency that indicate that a neural network that consists of over five successive layers of elements would be considered deep, all right? I like to say maybe seven because I feel like five is a little shallow, but they say over five, all right? And I say that's workable because truthfully, if it's wide enough, you should be able to accomplish just about anything at about four layers. You get past five, maybe six, maybe seven layers, you have to start using a lot of extra things in here in order to make stuff work. So a multi-layer perceptron or the MLP is an example of something that doesn't utilize just strict shallow learning processes, shallow connections, right? 
connection between one element and the integrator within that paradigm, like what we're looking at in the neuron system, is critical to our uh, look at this, all right? So what's the next step of the process? What was the next things we built in these AI paradigms? Something like the Hagen, uh, the Heidelberg Analog Evolutionary Neural Network, all right? Uh, whenever these things came out, uh, people were all on about, uh, you know, we were gonna end up with uh, Terminators, right? You like that? You want Terminators? That's how we get Terminators, all right? We get we give thinking machines, and then they get ideas, and then the ideas turn into people are just in the way, and then they nuke us, okay? Um, but there's a, there's a quote in Terminator 2, right? Where John's standing there and he says, can you learn, right? Can you like try to not be, you know, more, be more human, right? Not be such a dork all the time, you know? And the Terminator says, my CPU is a neural net processor, a learning computer, right? And so, you know, it's, we think about it, when did this become, this became part of our collective consciousness, right? People began to think in these terms. Computers have become mystical within many people's notions. There was an uh, article that I was sent by one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Hare, that discussed the concept that people feel like their code is more secure when utilizing something like Copilot to help them develop it. Despite the fact that by every metric that was assessed within the study, the actual code was more insecure. Statistically, normally more insecure by utilizing mechanisms like Copilot to integrate code snippets and code operations. So when we become more dependent on these systems, thinking that they have somehow evolved to our level of process and our level of concept, right, we're going to become potentially more at risk with security and uh, privacy and uh, our individual identities being risked in this space, okay? We've seen many of the things that are coming out here. I think you guys have all seen these. Everybody seen the uh, Boston Dynamics robots dancing? Yeah. Okay. Pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty amazing, all right? Crazy that, that we went from these things barely being able to walk to a few years later, they can do crazy dance moves that probably make me look like I have two, maybe even three left feet, okay? So um, the one that I think, this is actually very up to date, okay? This is less than three weeks old. This is Tesla bot. Oh, wow. It is utilizing little test, little buttons, little micro architectures on the fingers of the left and right hands for pressure indication to show how hard the fingers are actually touching the shell of an egg, okay? Previously, imagine how delicate and difficult it is for an actuator to know how much to compress the egg in order to adequately grab onto it without letting it slip, but at the same time, not crushing its shell. So if we want Tesla bot to be able to start cooking for us, then we can make sure that it can do this, okay? We don't want it breaking eggs in the morning. Right? We don't have to want to come out and holler at it, you know? Tesla bot, how dare you drop me? Okay? Are we, gonna, are we gonna treat our robots like that? I don't know. Because it's not a question of whether or not these are around. That's very real, okay? If it can be cheaper than a Tesla car, <laughs> I am one, okay? I want one. I've wanted one since I was this big, okay? So this excites me. The reason why I'm in this field, the reason why I'm in this space is because there is nothing that gets me excited more than the thought process I get if I have my own robot, okay? Because I think that would be cool. I've built many myself. None of them are even remotely as awesome as okay? Especially none of them can dance, all right? That goes back to, like, th this would, this is, as I said, like, last week, this is like maybe 10, 12 years ago, uh, ATRs, uh, human, human dynamic brain robot, okay? So we've, we've come quite a ways from that blocky thing to something that's relatively uh, modernized and working with accomplishing quite a bit of complex process. I mentioned these and I've updated these slides from the original indications to show that there's another process that's also coming along the way on this particular front, and that is a bio-integration process or hybridization of neural networks. We know previously from the discussion that basics, the basis of the biological inspiration of the neural network is that a neuron is a, a, a electric or bioelectric system. So if I can integrate that into a chip structure, this is a lattice 
right? There's a little grid lattice underneath of this, and attached to that are a series of sensors. Those sensors are monitoring the depolarization and the signals being sent back and forth between neurons that are actually plated onto that surface, all right? This is a artist, uh, artist interpretation of an AI uh, inspired construct, right, for the idea of a little brain inspired chip. These things are actually a lot more messy than that right now. They're not in little, little pans, but they do call them brain dish, which I think is weird uh, as a name. But if you want to look at it, there's a link uh, to brain dish on the next page, all right? So what does this actually look like? If we zoomed in on brain dish and we look at one subsection of the region, we notice neurons with branching components. That's the connectome, that's the connectivity of those individual neurons. If we utilize activations, these are, this is a little bit too bright. I'm going to turn this off real quick. Some of these other slides. That one there. Yeah, 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 Much better. Much better. Okay. Yeah, because I need you to be able to see what I'm talking about here. This is a UV fluorescence spectroscopy image of the activation potentials of the elements between the neurons that are plated on the surface. Okay. What I'm doing is I'm actually putting in signals from the outside of this network, and then I'm watching how those neurons interact with each other. If I utilize a imaging system to sort of take a photograph and expose the activations, how, this, how these neurons and connections integrate with one another, I can watch their patterns of integration. This ends up becoming a graph of connected elements. Can I do something with this? Absolutely. They've trained these things to play Pong with cultured human brain cells. Do I think this is dangerous? 1,000% dangerous, okay? But at the same time, just like everything else we're discussing, it's here, we can't do anything about it. So we have to be real with ourselves to say, this is technology that's going to exist. We may translate as developers from the current implementation technologies for neural applications of artificial neural networks to biologically inspired or biologically integrated hybrid neural networks, okay? You may actually end up programming cells in a chip. Who knows? I mean, decade down the road for sure, we're definitely gonna see this technology in real, in situ. So I think in some senses, whenever I make the argument to you that understanding the fundamental biological constructs behind this system matter to a great degree, that is because these may become prevalent in the field, right? Depending on how we're working with it. So in your understanding of being able to know at least what's going on under the hood of this system is gonna be important. All right, um, we've talked about multi-layered artificial neural networks. We've talked about the application so far, mentioned, mentioned beforehand, speech recognition, image recognition and segmentation, right? Natural language process, machine translation. How many of you guys use some form of machine translation? Take something that you're reading and put it into your native language, for instance. Okay? Yeah? Okay. Are you guys, you guys in the back are all just super native and never use Google Translate? All right. Good. Good. I'm glad. I mean, I, I appreciate that, right? Because I've had some people that are just like super dependent on it. Okay? There's nothing wrong with it to a certain extent, but at the same time, we have to understand that if we're going to get fluid or work in a space, we have to have good understanding of the, of the language in the space. But I would say there is an argument that could be made, and I have even a student that is working with a senior design project, and their goal is to create a set of like glasses or a mask or whatever that could work to translate language. I saw something at um, the Consumer Electronics Show. There was a, a heads-up display integrated into a pair of glasses that had a speech-to-text mechanism and then a translation mechanism and then displayed a closed captioning of whatever the person you were talking about was saying in the language of the wearer. Okay? We can, we can potentially eliminate language barriers from many of these paradigms. Are they fast enough for this? Not yet. Okay? No, it's not even close to fast enough yet. So even with things like GPTs, which were originally developed for translation, GPTs actually aren't very good at translation. We're going to look at the reason why they sort of forgot how to do their primary operational task and how that happens. Right? It's part of it, something that was called transfer learning. We'll talk about that along the way in here. Image captioning, tagging, recognition, description, um, something like uh, Facebook's methodologies. Right? Facebook has a methodology of doing things like 
uh, recommending to you potential tags using facial cluster recognition for those people that are included within your friend base, right? So once you tag <coughs> an individual in part of a picture, and then you tag them in another picture, uh, Facebook will begin to localize their facial features and suggest tags for individuals that are included within your pictures in the future. Okay, does that mean that they have like a facial recognition database? Absolutely, 100% they do. And they're gonna tell you that they don't, right? <laughs> but it's in there, and they could get at it if they wanted to, and I always, I always feel like whenever people say, no, no, we don't have access to that, yeah, you, you know it's there. Um, so other companies, right? Like I said, are benevolent robot overlords of Google. Uh, companies like Baidu and Tencent are huge in this area. Tencent's like the, I believe they're like the third largest uh, financier of both like game and software development as well as for AI generation. Okay, another one if you guys come across and you work with any kind of pre-trained networks, uh, one of their offshoots that's associated with Moron is called Hugging Face, all right, and that's a libel, uh, the label management subsystem, all right, so Tencent's work uh, along with Facebook's work with uh, many of these spaces, these are the big players in many of the AI development tool systems and tool chains, right? So when we talk about it in the syllabus originally, becoming film familiar with the tool chains that are out there, Facebook is PyTorch, if you've ever heard of it, mm -hmm. and then Google is TensorFlow, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. So Google's, Google's TensorFlow framework uh, and their TPU, right? They actually have a uh, compute-specific hardware that's designed to run in their accelerated infrastructure. So the, either the compute accelerated hardware or those bio-integrated systems are also involved with that, right? So Google's AlphaFold and AlphaGo are based upon their, their Tensor TPSC. AlphaFold is utilized for biological uh, systems, right? See how a protein folds. Really cool part about that is we may be able to start creating customized uh, drugs for individuals, right? If I can see how your proteins fold, I might be able to see how the opening on that protein is slightly different. And so I could create a special drug and then test it utilizing AlphaFold to be able to determine how well it interfaces with it. AlphaGo is a really advanced computer that can beat anybody go. Okay. I don't, I, that's, that's where it stops, okay? It was a toy, it was a toy. But it's where this started, it's where this started. So somebody wanted to try to create, you know, a, a better a better bot, we had chess, we had all, we had, you know, checkers is basically a solved game. Uh, chess is getting to where it's almost a solved game. But there are two to, the, I believe, the 136 potential configurations of chess game. So it's slightly more com computations than we can accurately or adequately <coughs> Many of the systems, I'm going to make this commentary on this, on this particular front, and that is many of the systems that we deal with here are solution-driven processes. So we start off with the paradigm of we have a problem. We as humanity have many problems. We create some problems for ourselves. Something like games are problems we create for ourselves. We're, they're challenges that we create for ourselves. We also develop sets of rules, interaction process, interaction potential in that space. When we expose AI to it, many times the problem that AI runs into is that there isn't a fixed best case solution, right? AI mechanisms for algorithmic search. So if you guys follow, follow on from this notion, from algorithmic search, what is one of the limitations of algorithmic search? So let's just think about something simple like node or graph search. We're just matriculating through a graph. We're in the city and we're trying to build a GPS solution to be able to get out of the city. Do we have to look at every single possible route that can exist in order to be able to determine the one that provides us with the fastest solution? Yes. yes. From an algorithmic perspective, we do have to look at every single possible permutation of a path that could exist from where you are to where you're going. So that root solution process is difficult utilizing purely algorithmic methodology. We have to imply or have to include heuristics. Heuristics are what? Adaptive rules that allow us underneath certain circumstances to eliminate at least a certain number of possibilities. 
So whatever you're dealing with, either a large number or a unsatisfactorily big number, right? Something you don't want to actually look through. An algorithmic solution is not desirable. We're going to go into what are called stochastic solutions. Those are the probabilistic solutions that are implied in things like adaptive networks. So AlphaGo, playing Go is a game that has more, I don't even know how many permutations. I believe it's in the 200s, power of 200s, as far as how many potential permutations of a game of Go can have. I, think it was, I believe it's in the 230s, right? So it's like two to the 230th power, number of potential games that can occur. So what does that end up being? A lot, more than you're ever going to actually search through. So let's imagine any potential configuration of the board at the current moment. Let's imagine that I have to evaluate not only just the best move that I can get in the next state, but I have to play the game out to completion for the remainder of the game every single time I make a new move. How long is that gonna take? Three forevers, okay? <laughs> exactly, exactly three forevers. No, it's just gonna take way longer. Uh, so there's a, uh, if any of you guys watch Star Trek, right? All right, so the first episode of the next generation, or se excuse me, second episode of the next generation uh, is called The Naked Now, and there is an, a, a portion at the end where one of the engineers takes all the control chips out of part of the ship, all right? And they have an android on board, and the android is putting the little chips back in place. And someone comes over to him and asks, how long is this going to take? And he says, slightly longer than we have, okay? So that's the answer to the question of running the rest of the game out will take slightly longer than we have, like maybe the rest of a human lifetime. So what we have to do is we have to be able to solve systems that are acceptable. We have to come up with solutions that will occur within the scope of our capacity, which require us to narrow down the scope of possibilities. We're good at this as humans, relatively. But typically what we tend to think about is that the, that the individual that's able to refine the scope and narrow it and maintain it within the realm or the confines of rational output, that is the individual that operates most satisfactorily, right? That's the person that is the most smart, wise. They have the knowledge and then they apply it appropriately under the circumstances. So application, the transition between AlphaGo, this game analysis paradigm, and AlphaFold, the extension of this game analysis paradigm, does what? There's a million ways a protein could fold. So how does alpha fold narrow down the processes, right? It could go this way, it could go this way, it could go this way, it could go this Whatever happens in that case. It says, well, most likely, based upon all the other molecules I've looked at, that if it has this and this and this, then it's going to fold this way. So it utilizes a series of rules based upon probabilistic assessment to be able to determine the most likely outcome. So it's supervised in the effect of saying that it has learned from past example and is gonna utilize generalizable concepts. However, if it runs into a problem later on in the system and says, wait, the estimation that I used means this molecule isn't workable or can't fold this way or doesn't outcome in the way that I expected it to based upon what I've seen from the data that I gathered, then we're gonna to have to work back. We're gonna to have to step back a few steps and go through the process again, okay? So similarly to how an adversarial game is played, you can extract the principles and the processes of how to generatively relate to and explain the interaction of atoms within a molecular structure. <coughs> oh, mentioned at the bottom here, shallow learning still 100% has its place. I think I said this to you beforehand, whenever you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Okay? Deep learning is not the solution to every single problem in the world. <laughs> There's a reason why that is the case, because if we start throwing deep learning level computational power and capacity at problems that are relatively easily solved using traditional shallow methods or traditional machine learning methods, guess what we're going to end up with? We're going to end up with systems that are far too complex in order to be able to survive. They're going to collapse under their own weight of both runtime and internal complexity. So, Parsimony, if it, for those of you who have been in my ISL lectures, parsimony is the capacity for us to generate something useful from a model, parse, to take apart, right? To parse a sentence or to parse a, a, a serial command, right? We take it apart into its individual components. Parsimonious models are those that can be deconstructed into their principal components 
And from their principal components, we can get something useful to our own understanding. If I can create a simple link between the cause and the effect of a specific change in the value of a system, if I can have a linear or low order polynomial model linking two events, then I can know how I can manipulate <coughs> that system. A deep learning model becomes so complex that attempting to try to tease anything of use out of it oftentimes becomes a black box, right? It, it, it might as well be magic happening on the inside of it in some of these cases. And you guys are gonna understand why. When we get into some of this stuff, it, it's gonna go fine for a while, and then it's gonna start to break down, at least with regard to how well we can understand it. Is there another alien or non-human level of thought or non-human level of data aggregation going on in these systems? Absolutely. They possess their own form of intelligence but it's the aggregate of the human intelligence that both designed it and fed it the information, all right? I can make the argument that AI at the moment, at least according to our understanding of it, is neither artificial nor intelligent, right? It doesn't actually think, it doesn't actually process, it just determines things based upon likelihoods and probabilities, and it's not artificial because, guess what? Humans took the pictures, <laughs> right? Humans gave it that data set. Humans labeled the data set structure. Are you guys familiar with Mechanical Turk? Okay, some parts of the world have a little bit more access to it or a little, little bit more knowledge of it. Uh, I know it's popular in places like Bangladesh uh, and Turkey, Turkmenistan. People are paid to label AI data. You ever seen this? Okay, guess what? You participated in it. You didn't know it. They're sneaky like that. But anytime you do a CAPTCHA, right, one of those that says, Click on all the parts of this picture that are a motorcycle. Yeah. Okay? Click on all the parts of this thing that are a bus. Mm -hmm. You're labeling data sets for them. Okay? You're labeling it. You're confirming the existing labeled model. So people, humans, are ultimately at the core of however these large data sets were constructed. And there are ethical and moral obligations to us in the way in which we are sort of exploiting portions of the world, especially in the lower income communities, to and be involved in these tasks where they're getting paid tens of a cent in order to label images, right? For companies to then make billions of dollars off of complicated modeling. So where we get the data for these processes, we're not, I'm not gonna belabor it too much because it is something that's just what it is, but think about this even in the perspective of something like modern generative models. Everybody knows what the generative models are. It's all over the news all the time. Mid-journey, Dolly, right? They build pictures for you. What do they make pictures based on? They make pictures based upon human art. Humans made the art that those systems were trained with. So that it's not artificial. It's not generated within itself. It's generated from the consensus of large bodies of human data, human processes. So it is actually human intelligence distilled through this modeling framework. So we're still taking advantage of human process. Where did a lot of this come from? Thanks, gamers, okay? The reason why we say thanks, gamers, is because GPUs from back in the, probably the late 90s, early 2000s, started with the process of wanting to render better and better graphics. What is graphics rendering? Anybody know what graphics rendering is with respect to mathematics? Hmm. I don't know specifically, but we did some of the things with black and a white line. Mm -hmm. So we need to, for stabilizing the robot of a line for line board, we need to derive the equation. Mm -hmm. And again, we need to integrate the equation. First, we need to integrate and derive the equation so it can be balanced. So if I talk about that one, so, so we, you're talking about image processing, image right? Image processing, yeah. So let's With think the about you're taking, you're taking imaging going into image processing. I'm talking about synthetic generation of images. Let's talk about a video game, 3D video game. Anybody know how that internal process works? Have you ever heard of something called ray tracing? <coughs> yes. Okay, ray tracing was the early version of this process in which a simulated light source interacted with a simulated surface. That surface was simulated by a group of polygons, right? Tri typically triangles that made up the external portion of the surface. Each of those triangles would simulate the process of the light hitting it, 
how it interacted with that light source, right? How it might manipulate its color, texture, etc. as it reflects that light source. You have a virtual camera within that space. So you have many rays, many vectors, interacting with many objects and surfaces with regard to their orthogonality and their incident reflection. Light bounces off, comes back to the camera. Camera renders or collects all of the light coming toward that surface. Now, the actual engines that worked with some of these 3D graphics designs that worked on early graphics compute cards, no, they did not involve explicit ray tracing. They used other tricks. But ray tracing has started to come out in modern graphics cards, right? True RTX. NVIDIA started working with True RTX and DTX with AMD. What is, that, what is the relationship to the, to the way in which we do uh, neural network computing or uh, computational frameworks? It's vector calculus. Right? That's all it is. It is going to be a type of linear algebraic process. So matrix computed by another matrix or by another incident matrix. Somebody realized this and they said, these things are just really, really fast, highly parallelized compute matrix compute systems. So what they did is they took the existing challenges within the neural network space, which we'll talk about the matrix formula, uh, of computing a network for a fully connected layer. And they took that process and they said, what if I asked it as a video rendering problem? What if I translated it into the language of that application specific processor? And bang, there we are, all right? So we, they, uh, uh, Jeffrey Hinton and uh, Jan LeCun, both of these guys instrumental in a paper uh, back in 2014 that was uh, titled Deep Learning, right? And that was an extension off from one of their other works that was called Deep Belief Networks. But the Deep Learning paper in 2013-14 that took the process for 3D, or excuse me, for 2D uh, image convolution and translated it into a 3D uh, multiplication framework inside the GPU was these two gentlemen right here. So everything that we have that can be considered deep learning on all the platforms we have is owed to these guys and their 17 uh, TAs slash administrative assistants, okay? So they had help, but at the same time, we challenge, we challenge, we say that these guys are the ones that did most of that work. Now, what's important about this? Why do I say that knowing who it is and who, what they've done is important? It's because these guys have started to sound the alarm bells on a lot of the information practices coming out of places like Google and Facebook, okay? Um, I know specifically Jeffrey Hinton recently discussed that his work with Google uh, and Jan LeCun also stepped down from his position at Facebook. Okay, so this slides out of date. This all happened last year. Something's up. Something's up. So these companies are going to have to start being reined in a little bit, okay? So being aware of what's going on in the world, being aware of how the companies are utilizing the data, what the compromises to the systems are is important for our understanding, okay? Um, data sets, how big data sets are getting. This is slide is from the 2016 from the Goodfellow book that we're utilizing. Notice it stops at something like the order of about 10 to the ninth for some of the larger sets. This slide indicates that some of the newer models like FLAN, GPT-NEO, and GPT-3, 1A, and 7B have parameterizations on order of 10 to the 12th power, okay? That's the data set scaling that's required for approximate training. That's the minimum number of points, data points necessary in order to approximately train or, or informally uh, update the model framework. So that's from 2021, okay? That's early GPT-3, GPT-GBS, and GPT-4 is somewhere in the neighborhood of, I believe, 17 billion parameters which I think would go to, I think somebody said it's 10 to the 16th or 10 to the 17th power for the number of rough data points that they're currently training it with, okay? These things are getting huge. Cool thing about it, both the models, right, in the billions of parameters and the hundreds of trillions of individual samples are being trained on, this is big, right? This is starting to get massive. This is where it becomes problematic for us because we can't adequately train these on home computers anymore, right? So our little home GPUs don't work. We have to allocate entire uh, football fields worth of, of GPU clusters in order to train and compete these models. 
But I'm going to talk to you about how these are good to a certain extent, but also how these are kind of going away from the fundamental principles that make neural networks and some of the deep learning principles a little bit more useful to us. And that probably we're going to have to cramp back the complexity uh, and start making more specialized networks that are more refined to the individual tasks. Okay? We'll go on from here. We'll actually talk about the real structural components of uh, neural networks, how they're put together, uh, how, they, how they flow, what we compute, and the underlying mathematical principles. Behind it, okay? So this is the introductory portion. Introductory framework has been laid out for us. We know what we're doing. We know what our objectives and goals are. And now we're going to start with the first version of those uh, lower networks and doing some of the mathematics and frameworks behind it. I am going to put out an assignment for you guys. It's going to be super basic. It's just going to be about making sure that you understand what the expectations are for the course and all those things, right? We've got our, the, we've closed our first full week out. So I want you guys to be able to make sure that you know what's going on. We should read through the syllabus, make sure you know what's going on with that, make sure you have access to the, to the book and to, you know, to all of the relevant notes and also that you've covered the basics of some of the tools that we're going to be using in the future. All right, thank you guys. I'll talk to you on Thursday.